we're going to build a big or not a big city, but like a town with like an E at the end, two N's and an E or whatever, however you spell town. And we're going to basically do the church timeline video in this town, but these are the early phases of it. So anyway, I was thinking, I digress. I was thinking about, uh, really some strong arguments for universalism. Like I'd always figured universalism was like a wishful thinking thing, a hopefulness thing, a like something that like would be great if it was true, but it like, you know, maybe it's not true. Right. Like, and uh, there are a few good arguments. Uh, there are a few okay arguments, but like, are there really any great arguments? These are not like unique to me, of course. And it's not just as simple as like, oh, God is love, therefore, you know, I, I figured there might be some cosmic mystery. There's some, the reason that argument is only like mid or maybe even good, but like not great is because there are cosmic mysteries beyond our understanding pertaining to ideas of good and evil. So while that is a thing of like, yeah, we could hope for and like kind of have some sort of confidence in that. Um, it's not really an amazing argument that like really gives like a solid, like, wow, this is actually a like a, a, this could become a mainline position beyond that. So the two arguments, the, the first is the idea of like the nature of love being like fundamentally non-coerced. Like the more coerced love is, the less genuine it is. You know, like if you feel forced to love, like love is itself the force. So you can't like force someone to love because then it's not love by definition. Um, and love is the force. Love isn't forced. Love is the force. And you can force maybe different aspects of love. You can, uh, you can water it, love like a plant. You can encourage love, right? So maybe you help love along, but you can't like force it. I get you can't force a genuine love. It's just not possible to do just due to the nature of love. So given that, it's like what is ultimately like the threat of hell looming over everyone's heads as like an ever-present reality like think about it if humans there is something to be said for like if hell is such a looming possibility you know if hell if going to hell is something that like is is a is a well even a minor pot actually for like this is this is an interesting thought if hell if going to hell is like actually possible what if, and like, hear, hear me out, what if even the smallest amount of fear about going to hell impe like pollutes the nature of love? Like, what if, like on a cosmic scale, if going to hell for all eternity, but by, by, by when I say going to hell, I don't mean as like a purgatorial punishment or as like a, as a temp finite punishment. I mean like eternal conscious torment, right? Think about it. If eternal conscious torment so that, that's what I mean by universalism. When I say universalist ending, I mean like nobody's going to be eternally consciously tormented. Um, besides maybe the demons do their own nature. But my thought is like, or, or this argument is basically saying if even the smallest possibility exists of that being the result of the actions of your finite life, the, the eternal conscious torment being the result of the actions of your finite life, if even the smallest possibility of that exists, that literally negates and, like, pollutes, like, your love. Like, just all of your love. Like, if you, if you believe that on a deep level, then every time you love someone, it's coerced. Like, if you... So, here's the argument. If eternal conscious torment is true and is a real possibility for everyone then everyone's love is thereby necessarily coerced. And by definition, because you're within a system that basically motivates you negatively. It's like a negative motivation, which isn't love. Like that's not, that's coercing love. It would mean like all the love you ever gave or received in your life was coerced because humans are all under that system. And it makes me, it makes sense. It, it makes sense in hindsight, like how much of my uh, life I have felt like not free to love, you know, I felt in, I, I've thought and acted in hyper calculated and conditional terms. Like literally you'd have to live your life in like the most calculated, least intuitive mode ever. If this is the case, 
And I was kind of surprised when other Christians like weren't doing that. And so, which just speaks to like some level of cognitive dissonance. Um, anyway, so the second argument, it's uh, people, almost everyone has probably had this floating thought at one point or another, but we should really focus on it, which is that like an all good God, who is the source of love, like who is the source of holiness and love would not agree to a story where the ending is eternal conscious torment for even one of for even one for even one human you know for even one like he wouldn't agree to basically dance with the devil in order to have like drama and then at the expense of like most humans like the majority of humans which is what the christian story suggests the christian story suggests oh for the sake of well free will but not because it's election um well we had the free will to damn ourselves but we don't have the free will to save ourselves and then there's and except we didn't even have free will to damn ourselves because that was all Adam and we're all extensions of Adam, blah, blah, blah. Like just, it all goes into this spiral. But at the end of the day, you get to the garden at the very least with Christianity in particular, you get to the garden. Why would God agree to build a garden where a snake could get in? And they're like, oh, that's one of the mysteries. That's one that, no, shut up. Like it's, it's actually like God being the source of all good would not agree to building a garden where a snake could get in. Like, period. He's all powerful. He's all good. He's all loving. So why would he build a garden where a snake will get in and deceive or be deceptive or tempt one of the people in the garden? Like a garden, a paradisal garden with temptations in it is not a paradisal garden. Like if you have to be on the lookout in this garden for ways to be tempted, then if you have to be wary for ways to be tempted, then that's not a real garden. That's not a true garden. Um, and that's not a true paradise, you know, because there's, there's danger lurking around the corner. That's the definition of the definition of paradise is that you don't have to worry about danger, like lurking around every corner. You know, the, apparently the Zoroastrian view is that like, is that the only reason that the, that God, that the source of all love and good agreed to interact with these evil forces in the first place was that he knew that he would defeat them. Like the foreknowledge of universalism is the only thing that justifies evil in the world um, from, from God's perspective or justifies letting evil into the world at all. Like why, like God would never do, God would never let evil in if he didn't know that we would ultimately win over evil. So that idea is like a very, very strong argument for universalism as well. But I'm sure there are many others for universalism, but it's just the most obvious ones are like ones like these with just the nature of love and the nature of God both kind of necessitate universalism as an ending. And it's very encouraging. It's very like, wow, I, I didn't think I could be this encouraged at, I didn't think rationality would ever bring me so much encouragement um, because it always seemed like reason was trying to like lead me astray in different ways. But I realized that it's, it's not that way. It's that like people just use reason as a tool to propagandize you into being hopeless so that they can take your money and gaslight you about like the true nature of spiritual things and power and all this. Um, I mean, now the way that think of it this way, right? Or this is how this is what I believe now basically is that there's like reality is like is like an animated kids movie in that like during the movie there is like a hero and a villain there are people who are doing the right things people who are doing the wrong things um there's conflict there's there's tension there's um you know like all this there's stakes you know all this stuff is going on and the villain does get defeated and punished at the end right it's not like the villains don't go unpunished but then at the very, very end, you know what happens at the very, very end of an animated kids movie? They all have a dance party. You know, everybody just gets starts dancing. Even from jail, the, the villains will dance. I mean, I think that's uh, in Megamind. The villain of Megamind was dancing in jail, you know, at the end of the movie. And uh, that's how I imagine, like, the ending of reality on that ultimate level, on, on such an ultimate, like, eternal level to be, is that, like, sure... Like what you do in this life does matter and there there probably are punishments and there probably are rewards and there and obviously doing the right thing is important doing the wrong thing you should avoid 
but at the end of the day, like God wouldn't let anyone, uh, like wouldn't let anyone just be damned forever. Like, I don't, I don't believe that he would. And, or she, or, you know, I mean, divine masculine and feminine aspects, like just God, I don't like God would not allow that. Um, of course the analogy isn't perfect, right? Like there's, if you make, if you imagine like the battle between Mario and Bowser as an analogy of the battle between God and the enemy, right? Um, in that case, it's, it's not like an applicable analogy because you're, you're basically saying that the source of all evil will, the source of all evil who literally is just thoroughly like evil, you know, uh, would be in the dance party at the end. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like on our, our scale of reality, like on Mario's scale and Bowser's scale of reality, sure, they reflect these cosmic higher principles of like good and evil. But at the end of the day, it is slightly different like Bowser being in heaven uh, versus, you know, the enemy ever being in heaven, which wouldn't work, which, which again is a huge flaw with the Christian story because the Christian story suggests that like there was paradise before. And for some reason, like, like there was a snake in the garden somehow, which just means it's not paradise. And it means that God let that in. So anyway.